I'd like to welcome everybody who's joined in uh, to the workshop number nine this morning. My name is Odile Burden and I will be your host. Good morning, Mlandi from Butch. Um, today, we are very excited to welcome Dr. Isabel Tarling. Uh, she's going to be talking about online PD to boost your creative arts teaching. Now, maybe just give a little bit of a, a short intro to who Dr. Tarling is. She is an experienced learning design specialist, having worked in the e-learning industry and as a teacher for more than 20 years. Most recently, she's collaborated with the WCED to develop a language across the curriculum course for teachers to become language teachers in all subject areas as part of the UNESCO OE4BW project. She's skilled in research, curriculum development, and on and offline learning design public speaking and teaching with a PhD in education technology from the University of Cape Town. And with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Dr. Isabel Tarling. Welcome. Thanks, Adil. Thank you so much for your time and welcome, everybody. I don't even, um, I'm trying to see where everybody is. So um, if you can go to our first slide, Adil, that would be great. Sure. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, so one of um, my favorite things in the world is beauty and looking at beauty in all sorts of places and all sorts of things. And what we do with um, finding when, when we, what we do with the beauty when we find it and um, it, there's so much joy in color and joy in design and um, so, so creative art really speaks to where I come from. And that's the next slide, Adele. There we go. So just a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm a learning science scholar and instructional designer, but mostly I think um, I, I love being a creator and maker. Um, and, and finding beauty and making something with it. So, um, I mean, as a person, I'm happy and joyful, uh, creative, and I I'm, I'm in love with living. <laughs> so can you please, because I don't know who you are, I don't know where you are, can you go look where it says the chat at the top right and just go tell me I am, and then finish that line. So I can see who's with me and I can find out where you are, where you're, Someone, Chloe is from Strandfontein and from Kalesrippa. Now, if you can, Chloe and Anastasia, thank you. Can you go and use the chat and tell me I am, and then tell me what you are. Are you, uh, you can do anything there. You can finish that sentence, I am. Let me see. This shouldn't be hard. <laughs> this should be an easy one. Hello, Christina. Uh, there we go. I am from Paul and VR. Hmm. You're going to have to tell me what VR is. I'm an art teacher from Wellington. I'm a grade one teacher. I'm happy. Yay, Lalu. Well done. I like it. I'm an artist and a teacher. I'm a dancer. I'm excited to listen to you. Thanks, Christina. <laughs> I'm a violinist, a teacher, a mom, a dancer. I'm eager to learn. I'm a high school art teacher. Um, hello from Claymont, Lorna. <laughs> Um, I'm a teacher and an artist. I'm a grade one teacher. I'm a visual art and creative teacher from Poch. I'm inspired. Yay! That is fantastic. I'm a foundation based teacher. I'm a language teacher with love um, for the arts. Um, there we go. I'm an instructional designer. I, now that one's gone so far, it was joyful. Um, I'm a dog mother, a girlfriend, a sister, an art teacher. I'm um, listening while gardening. Oh, yes, Lauren, work with that beauty of the soil. Um, uh, I'm a piano and con uh, um, I teach the piano and conduct a regional children's choir. Wow, that is wonderful. You certainly, certainly are inspired, Lisa Brown. Um, I am an art teacher. I'm a musician and art teacher. It's so interesting when you just put I am on. Um, how people define themselves and how you defining yourselves around what you do. Some people define themselves around what they do. Some people define themselves around what they are. Um, I teach art. I, I do this. Um, I am happy, like someone said. 
Um, I'm and what they're doing at the moment. I'm listening while I'm gardening. Um, a creative soul trying to infuse creativity into every aspect of life. Absolutely. I'm passionate, crazy, out of the box teacher. I love it. That is fantastic. So when you think about I am and the beauty of I am and the incredible diversity of I am, I could never in a zillion years in two minutes find out what I'm finding out here now and be so wowed by this incredible response from all of you. So just keep that in mind. We're going we're gonna to think through it as we process and going forward. So, and please keep typing. If you think of something as I'm talking, um, start with I am or whatever, just put the chat, go for the chat and keep using it because um, it's so critical that we, we, we do while we learn. And often our thumbs do really well while we learn. Um, and here we've got a PGCE student. Well done. And a professional dancer. So, oh, I love that, Annie. I'm enough. Definitely. Um, sorry, it's my dog. If you hear the noise, it's the two dogs playing ruffle tuffle outside and hitting the clues. I can't do anything about it. They're just having fun. And that's the beauty of the moment, hey? <laughs> so, if we go to the next slide, I want to just talk to you a little bit about what it means when we're thinking with our creative art students in whatever space. If we're thinking with their bodies, if we're thinking with their minds, if we're thinking with their hands, um, with their hands as they play, uh, what does it mean to be thinking? Um, and we call this the cognitive load theory. And that's what I was starting to say and give you some ideas around where we are. So when we, when we want to learn, any learning that takes place, we, we go through very, um, I made it so simple, but this is really, really complex. So, but for now, it's, it's simple, okay? We, if you look at this picture on, this, on the screen, you'll see there's a question mark. And the question mark is everything that goes into me, into my thinking, into my doing, through the senses. Through my eyes, my ears, my sense of gravity, my sense of direction, everything that goes in through the senses. Um, to my body, if I'm moving, how do I move? How do I feel the, the beat? How do I, I represent what I'm thinking? Everything that goes through um, my senses comes into my brain, then goes to a part that we call the working memory, where it starts working and people start thinking around it. And your working memory will then start doing very interesting things. From the working memory, it goes to the shorter memory. And then hopefully it goes to the long term. And so you've got that path. Now, I want you to go and tell me in the chat um, what you had for supper four nights ago. Tell me in the chat what you had for supper. And if you, if you can't remember, that's also fine. You can put it in. No idea. <laughs> Sushi, that's a brilliant one. What did you have four nights ago? Uh, pasta, no clue, says Helga. Andrea can remember she had pasta, uh, tomato soup uh, from Annie, a smoothie. Can't remember, but I was not hungry. Uh, there's lots of things coming up, but there's also a few that says I can't remember, okay? <laughs> um, and it's absolutely fine if you can't remember, and if there's no idea, that's also fine. Um, there we go. So we can see what different people had. And now if I ask you, when you drive um, to the mall or to the shops or wherever it is you're driving, um, do you often remember how many traffic lights were red or how many traffic lights were green? Um, let's say you're driving from here and you want to go and look at uh, the, the lights in Cape Town. Do you remember how many traffic lights are green or how many traffic lights are blue or are red? <laughs> no, no, we don't. So. And this is what I wanted to show you here. So with, with some information, when it gets into our brain, if you look at the blue mark, the blue question mark, the sense goes in, and then our working memory has to do two things. It has to say this is relevant and this is irrelevant. This is consequential, this is inconsequential. So what our working memory will do then, with all this information that comes in at us, our working memory is standing guard and saying, this, mess 
memory, uh, this information is irrelevant, you can forget it. How many robots were red or green on your way to work is irrelevant. Did you stop at your robot? Yes, if it was red. <laughs> or if there was a danger? Yes. But it definitely says this is irrelevant information. Have I seen an accident on the way to school or something unusual? Um, I was going to the CTRI a little while ago and there was this herd of cows blocking the way and I couldn't get to, to the meeting on time. So what instantly happened was I remember it because it was consequential. It was relevant. I couldn't go further. I stood there for 20 minutes while this herd of cows were moving across the road. And that's what often happens with our working memory. It will take the inconsequential stuff, put it on the back burner, and it will only remember the stuff that, it, that is important. And then from that relevant group, it will go to our short-term memory. And then in the short-term memory, if we do something with it, it will go to the long-term memory. Now, when we think of creative arts, a lot happens in this working memory space. When, our, when we're doing visual arts, we everything that is visual, that is color, that is design, that is design elements, it goes into the working memory. And if we do something with it, if we say it must go from here and I must now get the child to go and mimic it, to make a quick sketch about it, to use a diary or a journal to write down their ideas about a, a painting or the color use. Now we're forcing the working memory to do something with it. And now we can get the working memory to take the information and move it along to the long-term memory. So all of this cognitive load theory tells us about learning. And with the creative arts, learning happens in so many different places, but it, it's something that happens between the ears. It happens between people, but it happens between the ears. And when I'm thinking of that, it's so difficult to see the process of learning, the process of how an idea from my senses gets moved to a space in the brain where it's now getting learned. That as a teacher, if I can find the, the, the stop gaps or the pitfalls where the learning isn't happening, I can fix it. But I can't see what's going on in the brain. So that's my problem. And then often what happens as well is that we overload the system. So what you've often experienced is, and I'm sure you've seen this in your students, if you go to an incredible museum, the first couple of paintings you're awed by, you love it. By the end of the day, if you've been walking through this museum, it's like it's just what you're just looking at the end. You're not really analyzing or rippling with it because you've just been overloaded. Or if you go to a concert for the whole day, by the end of the concert, you've just had so much stimulus coming in. And if someone asks you to tell them the story, you'll only pick the highlights because those are the pieces you can really remember. But you really have to work hard to get to the pieces you can't. And then the pieces that were irrelevant, the working memory ignored. So that's what happens in our art classes, in our classes generally, and in our lives. And there's a theory that our working memory since COVID as a, as a global group has been overtaxed to the point that we're so overloaded with, with information and content that our working memory is picking out relevant information that it shouldn't. So we're forgetting things that we shouldn't forget because our working memory is so overloaded. So one of the things that is really good to do in your classroom is to scaffold learning. To take, if I'm teaching something really, really difficult, and to break it down into pieces so I can, I can design what are the pieces that go in step by step by step to teach a process and to limit the load on our cognitive, on our working memory. And that's what cognitive load theory is. It's saying, how do I manage the load on the cognitive on the working memory, how do I get children to be active and doing? And then how, when they're active and doing, how that memory will be fastened in their head. So um, Leanne says, she, oh my word, that happens so much. It's exactly it too. It's, it's, it's making a very complex theory very visually visible to us. 
so if we go to the next slide, um, I actually want us to skip the next two slides. Um, can we go to slide slide six? So part of the there we go. Um, part of what we do in the art class in all classes is we want to encourage our children to be self-directed learners. We want to encourage ourselves to be self-directed learners. Um, so one of the things that self-directed learning is all about is it's saying it starts by a, a learner taking initiative and setting goals for their learning. They're looking at a drama and they've got to go and create a drama. They work together and they say, um, these are the goals that we want to achieve if we're a group setting the, the drama. Then we go and look at the motivation. Um, do I go and look at how I want to do the drama? Do I scaffold as a teacher? Do I say to them, you must do this, then this, then this, then this? And then, at, let's say in the first term, I scaffold it very carefully. By the fourth term, I only give them small little steps and say, okay, now you scaffold your own learning because you've learned how to do this. Um, but very much the self-directed learner needs to be able to set goals. They need to be able to identify these are the resources, human and material, that I need to achieve those goals. They need to evaluate their learning. And then at the end, they need to go and say, how can I improve on this? Which is the art process that we want them to teach. And when we're looking at the cognitive load theory, we need to very carefully manage that self-directedness because we can't just go and throw them into the deep side and say, set goals. We've actually got to teach them how to set goals. We've actually got to teach them how do I identify the material and the human resources I need to achieve this? And we've got to teach them how to evaluate, break it down, because if we overburden the working memory, they're not going to be able to do it. It's just going to, they're going to be standing around getting naughty in the class when, we, when they're actually, the naughtiness is actually hiding, I don't know what to do. So if we go to the next slide, please. What I want us to think about is when we're in the creative arts class, what resources? Now, remember I said to you, the learning happens here. It's, it's something that happens between the ears that we can't see. But sometimes we're able to use digital resources to help us to see what that learning process looks like. Now, if we just think of creative arts, just creative arts, you're thinking of, of, of visual arts. You're thinking of maybe the creative elements that you're teaching, or you're teaching them a technique to use with different brushes, or with different um, mediums, or whatever it is. Can you think of a resource that can help you, or maybe you're using it already, that can help you to see the learning? For example, if I want them to, to talk to each other around specific colors, can you think of a digital resource that you can use to help them to show what it is that they're thinking of. I can think of one. I don't know if you've used, for example, Padlet. Has anyone here used Padlet? There we go, we've got tutorials. Can you be very, very specific? Because sometimes when we say um, um, online resources, Anastasia or, or Anina, thank you so much for sharing. What, can you say exactly which one so that everyone here can learn from which ones you use? Uh, Canva? Yes, definitely. I can get Canva and get them to show me on that. I can get them to look at YouTube and show us the video they're using. Um, uh, it's okay, Tanya, if you haven't used a tablet before, but maybe you can think of something that you use on your phone, something sim simple. Um, so if you use flat, that's for, for, for our music. Hey, yeah, definitely, we can definitely use that. Um, visual images from Google, how to, um, to illustrate techniques, absolutely. We can use Google Arts and Culture, definitely. I hope you're all taking notes. If you've never used... Um, any of these resources, take some notes. And I'm sure that the, the um, um, organizers can copy the chat when we've finished and they can send it to us. I love that. Google Slides and Google Classroom, definitely. Let them show you what they're thinking. Let them show you what they want to do. 
TikTok, we've got uh, Dada Collage app is awesome, definitely. I, I haven't heard of it. I'll have to go look for it. Um, we've got Seesaw for interactive whiteboards. Create a topic regarding this. Uh, oh, definitely. So we'll have to go and see. Um, Michelle Wasserman is saying, um, Michelle, I, I don't know which one you created on there, but if you can tell us. Um, paper stuck on the walls for the collaboration. Yes, absolutely. Because now what we're doing is we're looking at technology, but also in an offline mode, we can stick papers on the wall and they can draw or show what they want to do. Pinterest, don't forget Pinterest, definitely. So this is just visual art. Please keep going. We'll, we'll have a list, an incredible list when we're done. So when we move on to the next slide, please, um, Daniel, or um, I think it's Daniel, yes. Um, now if we think of dance and drama, um, uh, I'm sure we saw that PGCE student that's a professional dance teacher. How do we get, so one of the things that happens with dance, with drama, with anything that's process orientated is that we want to have the child see the method that they're using and somehow identify that's where I'm going wrong. When I'm doing a dance move and I need to do a pirouette or I need to spin and I'm not turning up, you know, when you spin, you've got a spot. Um, I'm not a dancer. I come, my whole family are dancers. So I know the lingo. So don't let the words fool you. I have no idea what I'm doing. But if you spot and you've got a turn, how can I teach my child, my children, if this is how you spot and show them that they're not turning their head fast enough? Is there a tool we can use? Is there a tool we can use when they're doing drama and I want them to have a certain facial expression? And the facial expression that they're using is not the one that they want to talk about. So is there tools in the dance or the drama world, tools that are as simple that you can use on your phone and it can be offline, anything that can help the child to look at their process and break down the process and say, oh, that's where I'm going wrong or this is what's wrong in my method. You've got just dance games to get them to dance, definitely. Um, so you, you think of those dance games um, that they have on the plate or Xbox play. Um, musical chairs, uh, I can get them to use musical chairs for dancing, yes. So have you thought of it? If the children use their cell phones in the class, they record the video of each other doing a dance move or a drama or whatever. Now, the learning that's happening in the body about the um, the dance that the child is doing, they can now come and watch this watch the video that they've now made, and they can go, oh, that's where I'm making my foot wrong. It's completely offline. They don't need internet to make videos and to show them, but they can watch themselves doing it. And let's face it, this generation loves watching themselves. So if we have a tool like video that they can do, but now well, the problem is. How do I, as a teacher, without looking at 50 videos um, on 50 phones, how do I see that? So we can make a TikTok challenge, like um, Sadan is saying, make a TikTok challenge where they put it on. If children aren't allowed to put um, TikTok on their phone, what you can also do is use Padlet, or you can use any tool that allows them to share the video straight to their phone or straight to a central location. Like what Christina is saying, uh, Padlet, Christina is with a D. Um, uh, I'll have to see what Padlet is. I'm, I'm thinking that that could be something I need to investigate. But for example, Padlet allows you as the teacher to get them to all. <laughs> Sorry. So um, it gets them to share their videos to one place. Flipgrid is brilliant. It gets them to share the videos that they're making to one central place, and then you and the class can give them feedback on what it is that they're doing. Obviously, we're going to scaffold that learning. We're not going to just go let them go and comment freely on all the each other's videos because then they don't have the tools to say, this is how I give constructive, positive, building up criticism. This is how I break someone down or make fun of them. Which one are we going to avoid? So what Samantha is saying, definitely Flipgrid is brilliant if you want to try that out. How do I get my learners to share a video? And then the last one, but 
I think we've got, uh, Daniel, if you can go to the last slide, you can see who's my favorite artist there. Um, so if you go to the last slide, we've listed a lot of ideas around music. So, um, sorry, um, we've put ideas on. Yes, this one, you can stop here. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so what we do is um, we've created this collaborative thinking together process. Please, um, Daniel, can you go and copy all of this and just make it available to everyone? Um, if you've gone and you found some ideas here that, that can help you by all means, but I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the courses that we develop. So one of my passions is to help teachers to, to enjoy teaching, to love teaching too. And in creative arts, we've got so many wonderful tools like what we've listed here that you can learn to use. But a lot of teachers would say to me, I have no idea where to start. I'm so scared of using these, these things like TikTok and then getting in trouble because the school saw me using phones and phones are banned or um, the children shared inappropriate content or I'm so scared of it. Um, so what we do is if you go and look um, at these courses, we build courses to give you the tools and the skills to go and use technology in your class. So the creative arts course, if you go to the next slide, please, Daniel, um, the creative arts course I built and I had so much wonderful, oh, it's coming, it's coming. I'm not sure why it's not on the slide. <laughs> Sorry, Daniel. Um, so, Daniel's, Daniel's uh, getting it, he's putting it up for you. Okay. So, so one of the, the courses that we built is for the creative arts um, teachers, and it breaks down what you can do with technology in the music department. And I don't know if any of you met Betsy. Um, Betsy is probably one of the most amazing music subject advisors. She's retired now, but she wrote the music section for us, for example. And then we look at um, how do you teach things like score and rhythm and um, music appreciation? How do I teach it? Firstly, what is it? How, what are the content? And then secondly, how do I go and use technologies to go and teach it in my classroom? What, what tools can I use to teach theme or score or whatever? So that's what we, we do with, this, with our course. We break it down into how, how do I teach this topic? And how do I go and um, um, use technology to teach the topic? But it's all around teaching. So this course we created around um, the um, uh, visual music. We created around drama and found visual arts. And this is just one of the, the pages that you can see. We actually give you the tools that you use in your class to go and do it. So you, you'll see I am... Um, like I think every artist here, um, I, I'm never happy with the final product. So we're busy revamping this course. In January, this course will come out and we'll advertise on social media, on Facebook and all that. Uh, Lucy, could you put in the chat the link to um, our Facebook page and to um, maybe the, the website? Lucy and I work together. We were, we were the a team. We've got other people working with us, but the two of us are here today. And then we'll put on when this course comes out. But very often, um, you'll see what Anina does is she'll put out wonderful tools or resources on Facebook, online, that you can use. Christina, then, they make the most incredible stuff. Then what we do is we'll put those onto our Facebook page and we'll share it from the, what, the, um, the WCED pages so that you can get it. But you'll see Lucy's put the, the link in there. If you want to get put on the waiting list, get in contact with us so that we can put you on the waiting list for this course. Um, and it's all done online. So you don't have to go and attend a workshop. You work at your own pace. You don't go and say, I have to, to go and sit through a two-hour lecture. It's all very much self-driven, self-directed. You can see our Facebook page. If you follow us, we put these ideas on. And then in April next year, we have our arts month. So the course will be running, but we'll have on Facebook, we have lots of um, 
wonderful artist is coming to talk to us about visual arts and painting around music and what it is to do them to create this piece or to teach that piece so keep us on your your facebook pages on your i'm doing shameless marketing but i really hope that um we can help you go further with how you can teach creative arts in your classroom i've seen so much engagement and i see we've finished i'm so grateful for everyone being here Thank you for learning with us. Thank you for sharing your ideas. Um, definitely, I see you put Book Creator down, Debbie. Definitely, please go look at Book Creator. It's a brilliant tool, and it's also in the tool, uh, in, the, in the course. Thank you, Adil. Thank you so much, Dr. Tallinn, for this insightful um, workshop. Thank you for... The, uh, making the space available for teachers, really passionate teachers to engage with each other, to be inspired by one another and really just to get to know um, some new resources. I'll just mention for everyone that this chat uh, will stay open even after the workshop uh, is completed. So if you want to carry on this conversation in the chat box, if you want to get some more information about a, an app or an online tool that you've never heard of, please do continue in the chat box. Um, I will just say that, okay, we've come to the end of our current session. We're now going to go on a 10 minute break, stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee, uh, go and uh, do a Molly challenge, uh, go and browse through the exhibitor booths. And we will be back on the main stage at 10.40. So thank you everybody, have a wonderful morning.